So, Sean, you talked. You mentioned patent el things that were eligible for filing a patent application on. But what's eligibility all about? I mean, what is it, what are the things that are eligible and are not? Well, that's a very good question because recently that has come into question. So, basically, generically speaking, any new useful process, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter, or any new and useful improvement thereof, is deemed to be patent eligible subject matter. That's very, very broad. However, you do have those exclusions that I mentioned earlier, the laws of nature, such as the law of gravity, uh, natural phenomena, just wild animals out there as an example, and then abstract ideas. So those are not deemed to be patent eligible. However, again, one of the recent case laws that you may be familiar with are the DNA patents, so the, the breast cancer genes. So up until fairly recently, you could patent an isolated gene. That's no more. So in that, the, um, in that particular case, the Myriad Genetics case, where we're no longer able to patent isolated genes. And that, that's a new thing, and that's a, a really big deal right now. So, but you can patent what we're calling non-naturally occurring genetic material. And again, now what's being called into question are, like I said, some of these software type patents, some of these business type patents, if they're deemed to be abstract. Also, in the life sciences, diagnostic type claims. Many of those have been invalidated by the uh, Mayo versus Prometheus case. That's a relatively recent decision because they're saying those are merely laws of nature. All you're doing is observing a natural correlation. And so that's called those types of patents into question. So currently, this particular environment, we're really in flux with regard to what is eligible uh, for patenting. And very recently, as of December, there are the USPTO interim guidance that are trying to help us determine what is patent eligible. But that's it's actually it's really deemed confusing by many of us patent practitioners. And we're waiting for what we call the actual guidelines to issue because they're accepting comments from practitioners and, and, and elsewhere to try to figure out, okay, we're confused here. What is really eligible? So that question, you know, several years ago, easy to answer. Today, not so much. So it sounds really complicated. Yes. Well, the, also, the business implications. Um, so you're trying to take tech transfer out and make some money off of it for the university. The overnight when the ruling came out about uh, relative to bracket genes came out, genomic stocks went down almost 75% mm -hmm. just overnight, which means that venture capital doesn't want to invest into a sector that you've been kept from owning intellectual property in. So just to understand, like I said, don't get emotional. Dude, you spend five, six years of your life trying, coming up with an isolated gene and overnight there's a something that keeps investment capital from coming in. You can get emotional really quick. So just to understand these are not trivial issues. As soon as they make a decision like that, it can absolutely slash the value of, of what you have. So strike while the iron's hot. <laughs> So let's say I do have a patent and I get it issued and so forth, and that means that nobody can do that what I've got patented, right? That's correct. So they just look at that and they don't do it, or what do I have? To, I mean, how does that work? Um, in other words, do I have to do anything if I if I have a patent application, or if I have a patent that's issued, and somebody's doing what I thought I patented? Well, you know, who who has the responsibility to do something about it? Well, you, you're in litigation. You want to speak to that? Yeah. I don't personally handle patent litigation, but let me address that from the trademark side. So if you obtain a trademark registration, if, if we're East Carolina and someone opens up down the street and uses our mark in connection with identical products and we don't do anything about it, then we start to erode our trademark rights. And so you're only as strong as your efforts to police your marks. And so it, it pays to have an attorney using monitoring services and to send out cease and desist letters. You don't really need scalps at the end of the day. What you do need is a folder with a bunch of cease and desist letters in it so that if you're ever in a courtroom situation and, and someone is pressing you on that point, you say, look at these steps we took. 
uh, you want to have a, a case to make for your argument. So on the trademark side, I, I push people as hard as I can to focus on enforcement. That often gets lost in the shovel. They pay for the registration and then they don't want to see you again until the renewal's due in five years. But I think that you take that approach at your peril. I remember one time uh, the interest I was involved in was thinking about patent litigation. And we were talking to a relatively prominent trial attorney about it, and he said, why don't you go burn a million dollars cash in your fireplace while you think about it? Because that's what it's going to cost to even get into this with a large company. <clears throat> and so, you know, that side of things, my, <clears throat> my guidance in the past has been only if it's really worth a lot of money and a lot of your time and energy. How about you, Todd? Have you had any experience with any? Just relative to internet domains, too. I mean, this, so you go to all the trouble to brand, you get the trademark, you better make sure you've got because somebody's going to be out there slamming you in the internet domain area at the same time. So, um, remember Marty entered, talked about Mackenstein. She said transferred Mackenstein. I actually we we were going to get a trademark on Mackenstein at University of Texas because we thought it was cute and I had a cool logo. Um, boy, did I screw that up and should have gone down that road because almost immediately after it went out there, this is 1990. Uh, too, um, and I should have protected it, but we didn't. And it was just, um, and then domain names became huge and just making sure that your brand, if you are gonna hang your hat on a brand, make sure you're paying attention to both the internet domain as well as the actual mm -hmm. stuff. Cause it, business, if the brand, if the brand's useless, if you don't have the marketing around it. And so you might as well go all in at that point. And it's really hard to do the searches if you do the search on your term, then other people are looking and they'll buy the domain name just to keep you from accessing it. So. Right. And one thing to be aware of is that, you know, we're all used to using .com, .net, .edu, yeah. but there are new global top level domains that, that are gradually being rolled out. And in a couple of years, we're going to be in a situation where there's a thousand of them. Yeah. And right now there's a, a period where people can register, uh, kind of put their flag in the sand so that other people can't come in there and take them. And so you want to keep an eye out. So a dot bank is the big one that's coming yep. out yep. soon. Dot college is one that my university clients are interested in. Um, companies have to make a decision whether that's going to be useful. I mean, I, I tend to think of it like like um, streets on a map. And so the main street is dot com, and maybe the side streets are dot net. Uh, but where are these other ones going to be? Is it going to be good real estate where you have customers walking past your place or is no one ever going to go there? And right now it's just not clear because that system's not launched. I, I do a lot of brewery work and dot beer came out and, and they were bullish on dot beer. They think that that's going to be a street that people walk down, but we just don't know. But to your point, Tim, with respect to patent litigation, yes, it is indeed very expensive. And so you're thinking, okay, I had this patent, but it's going to cost me all this money to enforce it. You know, what good is it? Well, in some instances, it's going to be expensive on both sides. So it's likely that there may be a license agreement. And that may be more favorable and alternative to litigation. 